been sent as messengers of hope. Christ alone be our treasure, Christ alone our reward. Come bid the nations sing with us the praises of the Did ransom to the glory of his name. Now ascribe on ending worship. Now ascribe it. The following is a presentation of the Open Door Bible Baptist Church and Pastor Chris Tice. For more audio and video content, please check us out on the web at www.opendoornj.org.
stand together and worship the Lord this morning. Come on in and find your place. Glorious day. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. We'll sing this song together. How many are glad to be in God's house this morning? Amen. A few of you. We'll try that again. How many are glad to be in God's house this morning? Amen. All right. There we go. All right. Let's sing it together this morning. One day when heaven. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. The word became flesh and the light shine among us, His glory revealed. Living, He loved me. Dying, He saved me. Buried, He carried my sins far away. Rising, He justified. Freely, forever. One day.
that day, one day he's coming again. All our sickness, all our pain, all our problems, amen, all those things will go away and we'll be forever with the presence of Jesus, our Savior. Uh, I love this next song. It's really based off a classic hymn, uh, but I love the first verse. There's a river of gladness that pours from Emmanuel's veins. The sinner was plunged beneath the flood and got saved. Since then, I've walked in forgiveness. All of my guilt was erased. The chains of the past are broken at last. I got saved. Aren't you thankful for that? That all our sins forgiven are removed as far as the east is from the west and buried in the sea of forgetfulness. Let's sing this song together. I got saved. Sing it out. 
church. So my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love you're the consistent one. Lord, we're so thankful for all the things in our lives that we can never call our own. We can never merit, Lord, under our own goodness, but it's because of your goodness, God, that we have eternal life. God, that everything that we have, our possessions, even in this world, Lord, everything, every good thing, comes from the Father of lights, comes from heaven, comes from you. And God, I pray this morning as we, maybe our minds are boggled down by our discouragements, our problems. Uh, Lord, all, everyone in this room, self-included, Lord, we all have burdens that we're bearing. But I'm thankful, Lord, that we can come to you. We can cast all our cares on you because you care for us. Lord, I pray today, if anyone today, myself included, needs to be reminded how good you are. Father, we just pray that even just for a moment, the songs we just sang would be reminding our hearts that you are truly a good, good father. We love you. We thank you. We give you all the honor. We give you all the glory. We give you all the praise. 
It's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Maybe seated. Good to see you today. I have to get used to not saying dismiss the kids to the Children's Center. Um, and I'm thankful for that. We have um, Children's Center opened up today. Um, and so I'm thankful for um, just the accomplishment of, of getting that done and having the kids up there. And uh, if you haven't been up there, hopefully at the end of the service, you'll join us for just a prayer of dedication uh, up in the cabin there. So we're going to finish up a little bit early here so that we can go up there and do that. And I, I hope that everybody can uh, make it up there. If you have trouble with stairs, there is a, a ramp on the other side of the building, and we can direct you towards that. Um, but there's a stairwell just on the inside of the building here that will bring us up there. Some of you, if you have kids, you already went up there, and you've already checked your kids in. And I know that that may be a little bit different than what you're used to. Um, does anybody know Sister Debbie Downer and Brother Wet Blanket? You guys, anybody know those? Um, uh, determined not to be those people, all right? Um, some, sometimes um, when you introduce change um, to people who are kind of, uh, they don't like any change. Um, how many know change is a good thing? Um, as we uh, grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are changed and made more like Jesus. And so there's a growth and change that should be happening in our lives. Um, and sometimes we settle in into our comfort zones and we say, oh, I'm just never going to change. I'm just going to be who I am all the time. And again, don't be, uh, don't be that sister or brother that when there's new things that you just tend to say, well, I like how things used to be, and I don't like how this is, and I don't like how that is. Before you've even seen it or experienced it or know it, I hope that you uh, would trust that any of the changes that we make, in a sense, uh, to our methodologies or how we do things um, are prayed about and considered uh, from a lot of different angles before we just make a change. And while that may be um, not seen and not understood fully at those times, uh, they can be wonderful things when we just all together as a family um, just agree that we're going to try things even if they're new. Um, uh, I don't know if you're the person at the table that is unwilling to try anything new. Um, it's not always fun to go out to eat with people like that. Um, and sometimes it's like we want to you know, try some new things and do some new things. And those can be wonderful things if we embrace them and understand. Uh, there's something, though, that we need to all remind ourselves that will never change, and that is the Word of God and what we believe from the Scriptures. And so we're not, when I talk about change, I'm not talking about changing doctrine. I'm not talking about changing the truth of the gospel or uh, the truths of the Scripture. I'm just talking about sometimes the way that we do things. And how many know there is no service order in the Bible that tells us exactly as, as a church how to, how to gather and what to do and all the elements of that. And uh, I think a lot of times church gathering should be simpler than what it is, and we complicate it. But what we do want to do with our children especially is we want to give them an atmosphere uh, where they can grow uh, and learn the scriptures, uh, where they can be loved uh, by different people that will minister uh, to them, and that uh, it can just be an extension of your home as you're teaching them the Word of God, that they're being reminded of that on Sunday mornings. And then we want to we create a culture where these kids are growing up and up there while they have their music, that they're used to being in, on leading in worship and being a part of that. We're hoping we're going to raise some kids up that are going to, as adults, lead the church. And um, that's what we're trying to cultivate uh, with our children's ministry um, because we know that should the Lord tarry, we need to continue. We need to be strong. And uh, I don't want the strongest history of our church to be when I'm alive. I want it to be after I'm gone. I want it to continue and grow stronger and be better and uh, just grow. And uh, I don't want to be the bottleneck to that. So um, let's dismiss, um, you know, Sister Debbie Downer and Brother uh, Wet Blanket and uh, say, yeah, they're not, they're not up for membership. We're not going to allow them to become members of the church, all right? So uh, let's remind ourselves of that. If we have a tendency towards that, uh, sometimes we say, well, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a constructive critic. And usually uh, people that are real knowledgeable of how good they are at criticism, is uh, usually there's a negativity that's there. Uh, but the joy of the Lord is your strength. And uh, I'm thankful that uh, we can not just be positive-minded, but truly have joy. That's a fruit of God's spirit in our hearts and lives and come together 
uh, for the purpose of reaching the world for Jesus Christ as a church, and that's our desire. So today, uh, just a couple things. We'll finish the service. We'll have prayer and take our offering right at the end as we usually do, and then we'll all go upstairs. If we do that as quickly as possible without any kind of straggling along the way, it'll help us to uh, facilitate that. And so I hope that you'll join us and come up and see the new space. It's beautiful. Uh, and uh, so much that has gone into giving and doing and doing the work and all of those things, and I'm so thankful for that. We're not done yet, obviously, but it's another step, and for me, it's a leap forward uh, as we ha have taken this big step um, to uh, just just um, have a space to minister directly to our kids. Thankful for that today. Join me in the book of Titus, uh, Titus chapter number one. This is the book that we're going through as we uh, talk about um, a life that's rooted in the gospel and leadership that's rooted in the gospel. And uh, the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the good news uh, that our lives are rooted in, um, that we not only are saved by, but that we are sanctified by. We grow in the gospel. We continue to be led and motivated by the gospel, reminded who we are daily in our identity through the gospel. And we never get a to a place in our lives as Christians where we should say, well, I got saved from the gospel, but you know, now I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sanctified and doing things through my works, through my performance. No, it's always through the gospel and from the gospel uh, that we're properly motivated and informed uh, in the scriptures. And so uh, that's what we're looking at is Paul is writing this letter to a young man who has been left behind in a city that's a difficult place to minister in. Paul has moved on. He's continuing to do the work that God's called him to do and, 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 and ministering. And as he's left behind these believers who are gathering, he's giving instruction to Titus on what the church should look like, how it should be ordered and the structure of things uh, that are there. But as we talked about last week, not so much in you know, the order that we think of, but in the character of what things should be, the character of the leaders, the character of the congregation, and as we looked at last week, we, we talked about that godly leaders, Christian leaders, should be blameless in their lives, in their homes, in their interactions with unbelievers, uh, with their doctrine. Uh, they should be blameless, not in that they're perfect, but uh, that they cannot be falsely accused of things uh, and have those accusations stick to their lives. We're going to move on with the thought today, again, as we look at these characteristics of good leadership. The interpretation here in the scriptures, is that this is, these are the requirements or qualifications for elders or church leadership. Um, but I believe that the application can be made to all leadership in a sense that all good leaders should desire these qualities. All good leaders should desire to, to look like this uh, because I believe this looks like Jesus. Um, and that's our desire. Ultimately, the goal in sanctification is that we all look like Jesus. I mean, no, even if you're not in church leadership, you have some form of leadership. You may be a leader in your job. You may be a leader in your home, um, with your kids, with your family, with your spouse. Uh, there's leadership as we mentor people around us. And so uh, I think all of us should have a desire to be good leaders, people that are leading people to healthy growth and change and following Jesus wherever we go as believers. And um, elders... Church leaders need to, need to have a voice here uh, that encourages, and he says also a voice that is able to refute people uh, who, are, who are saying things that are in error and, and, and things that are not sound in doctrine. Pick up verse number five again of chapter one. He says, for this cause, here's the reason that I left you in Crete, Titus, that you should set in order the things that are wanting, that you should ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee, and then he gives these, these qualifications of these leaders, these elders, if any, be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. And we said these men should be blameless in their homes. A bishop, again, he says, must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed. They should be blameless in their character, not soon angry, not given to wine. No striker, not somebody who's looking for a fight, not someone who's looking for... Uh, just money. They're always out for themselves. Um, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober-minded, just, holy, temperate, 
and holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. This is blameless in their doctrine, we said, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. You see at the end of verse 9, it gives kind of a positive and a negative in the voice of the leader. He needs to know how to encourage with his preaching and teaching. But he also needs, needs to know how to um, stand up against, how to convince those who are in error uh, by being firm in the truth. And so there's kind of two sides to this. Be encouraging, you know, be, be uplifting, but not at the expense of truth. Don't leave truth out. Make sure that you're holding fast to the truth, to the doctrine, and that you're able to refute error in the way that you speak. Um, I think we would all agree, especially as we consider uh, the upcoming elections, even our own country, that there's a lot of poor leadership in our world. Um, and the options are not looking any better as, as we continue on. You know, we, we look at the options that are around us, and again, this is not a political message, so don't get stuck on that if you're a political-minded person. I, I'm not getting into politics today. I, I, I want us to say, you know, leadership in the church is important, but leadership in this world is needed when it comes to the good news of the gospel of Jesus and making a change in this world. And I'm talking about lasting change. And we don't have a lot of great examples in the world for leadership, but we're supposed to not necessarily look at the world for le leaders. We're supposed to look within to the church of God. And, and say, as leaders, as, as we're meant to, as the church, be spiritual leaders, spiritually minded people who are able to make a difference in our community. And I, I think he is identifying as we go on in the text, as Paul is wanting Titus to appoint leaders, but also to model leadership, Titus himself, to those leaders, what kind of model, what kind of example is Titus supposed to be as Paul's telling him who he should be as well, because as we talked about last week, do as I say and not as I do is poor leadership. So somebody who's leading should be living the life that they're leading others to live. We're not just saying it, we're doing it. Can a man uh, truly be obedient to God's word if he's a hearer of the word but not a doer of the word? If he simply knows the word of God but he's not living the word of God? And um, a quick survey of the verbs used in in the commands that Paul gives to Titus, paints a clear picture to us of the pattern that, that Paul is calling Titus to lead. Uh, as a matter of fact, he says in verse number 11, you need to be able to rebuke sharply. Verse 13, you need to be able to teach. Uh, chapter 2, verse 1, 2, 3, 9, and 15, you need to be able to encourage. Verse 6 uh, of chapter 2, you need to be encouraged and, and to rebuke. Verse 15, to remind. Chapter 3 and verse 1, you need to be able to warn. These are verbs that Paul is telling Titus he should have about his own leadership. And I think one of the things that this highlighted to me when I studied this is that there's two common dangers, I believe, in pastoral ministry. Uh, two common dangers in pastoral ministry and church leadership, and Paul is alerting us to both of them. And they are what we might call this, over-pastoring and under-pastoring. Over-pastoring and under-pastoring. Um, that, that's kind of the way I was looking at what he's, he's saying to Titus. You need to be aware of the fact that you could be too extreme in one way or the other in your leadership. How many have learned that as a parent? You can over-parent and you can under-parent. You may have learned that. You can over-parent, you can under-parent. Um, in your job, if you're a boss, if you have a position of leadership, you can over-manage and you can under-manage. How many here love to be micromanaged? Anybody love that? You know, you love to be, like, somebody tells you to do a job, you know your job, you know what you're supposed to do, and you're doing it, but then someone is not only telling you to do it, but they're telling you exactly how to do that job. Um, that's bad even when we, in a sense, have volunteers in the church, and we don't release them to do what they need to do. As far as everyone has gifted this, we need to be able to trust people just to do what they're gifted to do. I'm not talking about not having management, but I'm also talking about not being overbearing in the way that we manage or over-pastoring things. One of the greatest lessons I've learned as a leader in the last 13 years of pastoring this church is that things go better when I delegate and trust people to follow the Lord and the Holy Spirit that's within them. That's why we need to make sure we choose 
mature, qualified leaders, but as they are following the Lord, that we just trust them to do their job and, and, and release them to do their job and not constantly be asking, nagging, you know, every, need to know every nuance of the people. That's, that's over-management. Um, but also, I don't want to be so disconnected that I have no idea what's going on. That's under-management. Um, and, and this is what I believe that Paul is talking about. We're going to look at those two sides to the coin, being controlling or being careless. Which, which one do you tend to, in your leadership, go to? I'm not saying all the time, but maybe you have a natural tendency in leadership to do one of the two things. Now, when we are controlling, we tend to not like to admit that because we even like to control the way people view us, right? So we like to control what is our reputation. You can try to control your reputation, but in doing so, you're just going to continue to build a reputation that you are an overbearing, controlling person because you're even trying to control the way people view you. You ever be, uh, maybe, maybe you're the kind of person that you're so concerned that with the way that people view you that you are never able to truly be yourself. So you're constantly trying to put this, you know, best foot forward, and I think it comes from maybe good intentions. I'm trying to put this best foot forward, but in, in the end, I'm being a fraud because I'm not actually being who I am. I'm not being who I naturally am. I'm more kind of, you know, worried about what people think about me all the time, and so I'm never able to fully be who I am and, and know that who I am is okay and uh, that it is enough that God can use who I am as I am without me having to pretend to be somebody else. I like what my dad used to tell me. He used to say, you can either be a second-rate version of someone else or a first-rate version of yourself. And I, I, I never really understood what he was saying, but he was basically saying, don't compare yourself to other people and don't try to be somebody else. Be who you are. And you can either try to be a second-rate version of someone else. I think leadership is important. I think it's good that we have good leaders in our lives, but no good leader wants everybody under his leadership or her leadership to be exactly like them. A good parent is not trying to parent kids to be them. A good parent is parenting their kids to be themselves while embracing the things that they know they need to instill in their hearts and their character uh, that we're going to help them have success as they are who they are. We're not looking, as I mentioned last week, in the church for twins. We're looking for brothers and sisters. We don't need to be identical to each other. The standard within the church of God is not the pastor. I'm not trying to make people like me. I'm trying to encourage people to be like Jesus. I'm striving to be like Jesus. Let's all strive to be like Jesus. And in being ourselves, we can all strive to be like Jesus and find the place that God has for us both in the local church and without, uh, as we consider the leadership that God's given us everywhere and how broad that is, uh, and, and being ourselves actually helps us to minister further and have more influence with people in the gospel. None of us want, I think, to be controlling, but some of us have tendencies. It has a lot to do with perhaps your upbringing. It has a lot to do with insecurity. How many know that when you're overbearing and insecure... Uh, when you're overbearing, it's because you're insecure. It's because you're not really um, able to have self-control, and so you're trying to control everything else while you're not controlling yourself. And uh, I, I think sometimes we become sensitive to controlling areas um, outside of us instead of learning to embrace the control that the Spirit gives to us inside. Because the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. The ability to control oneself is not found in greater discipline. The, the ability to control oneself is found in greater devotion to Christ and the fruit of God's Spirit. And I'm not saying discipline doesn't help. Dis the Christian life is a disciplined life. Don't get me wrong. But it's not just discipline. It cannot be done apart from the power of the Spirit of God. And so we need God's Spirit. And so over-pastoring, as I would refer to myself in leadership, is what happens when a pastor or leader exercises too much control in the life of a church. I think I mentioned this last week. If not, I meant to. But I think one of the reasons why sometimes leaders don't want to be involved in church is because you have one leader trying to lead everybody instead of a leader that's producing other leaders and desiring to raise up and encourage other leaders to be leaders. 
what I, what I often know is as the church grows, where when we were uh, just getting started out, it was just kind of like being able to have a personal relationship, a daily relationship with everybody that was in the church. But then as the church grows, uh, I know as a pastor, what I have to be really focused on is identifying leaders and investing into leaders so that there will be more leaders to minister to the people that are coming, so that everyone's needs are met, so that everyone has somebody that's mentoring, discipling, and helping them. I don't want, I don't want the church's um, uh, growth to be contingent on me and my ability to lead everyone because I'm limited as a human being to being able to have a certain stretch and reach and touch with just a certain amount of people. I have the same amount of time in my week that you do. I have the same amount of ability, if you would, or, or, or time available to me. And then as we have family and children, we know that that can suck up a bunch of time in our lives and, and in a good way. That's a calling that God's given us uh, for leadership. But when you look at over-pastoring um, or over-being controlling, they're quick to suppress any dissent that may even end up in, in being bu- like a bully. I, I don't want any dissent. I don't want any disagreement. I don't want anybody to give an opinion that's opposite mine. They often personalize issues. They take disagreement personally, suggestions for change or criticism are responded to in a personal way with counter accusations. The unconscious aim of a leader in this mindset is personal control rather than a maturity in the congregation. Um, Sometimes we can cause people not to grow and mature because of this kind of leadership. And I would say this, there are certain, certain personalities that are more prone to follow this kind of leadership. So some people will want this kind of leader in the pulpit because they'd rather have someone just tell them what to do than for them to grow and have to do it themselves. I don't ever want, you know, uh, have, to, have to get to the point where I have to make these decisions for myself. I'd rather just have someone tell me, and I, I know people sometimes that get addicted to counseling. They can't make a decision unless someone is telling them the decision to make because they're so insecure about, the, about making decisions. And I, I know that this may sound funny, but I've had, I, I've had this even happen to me where someone will come and I need, need some counsel and then it'll turn into something like, I'm buying a car, should it be red or green? And, and I'm just like, well, what, what color do you like? Well, I just think you should be able to tell me, you know, as a, as a spiritual leader in my life. Th- these are not things that, that I want to have a say in it, if you would. I mean, if you want my opinion, I'll, 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 I guess I'll tell you what I like better, but that's not what should have bearing in your life. I don't have a desire to be overbearing in your family. God has given uh, leadership and order to each individual family, and I have a wife and I have a family. That's where my leadership is. And while I may give you good suggestions and I should be a good example to other people within the church of what a family, family life should look like, you cannot pattern your life or do everything the way that Chrissy and I do things in our home because it may not work for you. It just may not work for the context of your family or it may not work for the context of your jobs or how things are. We can glean good ideas, but we're not meant to just be copycats. We take ideas and we kind of make them our own and we learn what is the best way for us to go at this. Ultimately, we know as parents, we need to bring our children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And there's many ways that that can be done in, and there's, it's not a one-size-fits-all. As parents, we need to discipline our kids, but how many know that not every form of discipline fits every situation? There's not one form of discipline. Um, I think uh, I've experienced that within the church, um, not in the sense of just in the local context, but Sometimes churches all kind of read the same books and follow the same leaders and go through the same trends, okay, that are in Christian worlds. And so, like, this book on parenting becomes very popular. This book on marriage becomes very popular. It almost becomes like the Bible to to evangelicals. And they'll read a book and they'll say, oh, read this book. And while it's good that we should maybe get some good ideas on parenting, not every suggestion is a, we, we understand, it's not a command from God for us to do that. If it's not in the scripture, I can take some advice, but I don't need to make my family look like somebody else's family to be success. What you do need to do is you need to raise your children. You need to parent them 
as unto the Lord. You need to train them to love God and, and to know his word. And that may look different in the cultural context of your own family, and that's okay. Because we're not in competition with one another. And all of us have different kids with different personalities and sometimes different challenges and all kinds of different situations. And I'm not trying to make a one-size-fits-all when I'm making application uh, approach to. This is not 10 ways to do something, and this is the 10 commandments of parenting or in marriage. Uh, I think it's a good suggestion. I've heard people say this. You should, you should have regular dates with your spouse. How many, how many say if you're in a marriage, that's a good good suggestion. But some people say, well, you should have two date nights a week. Well, you may be able to do that, and there may be seasons of your life where you can't do that. There may be seasons of your life where you just have to stay home and be together and spend time together, and that may be the only option. But sometimes what we do is, well, I can't do it this way, so I'm just not going to do it at all. Like, I'm not going to find a creative way to, to spend time and make time for my spouse. Isn't ultimately that the goal? to have time together with your spouse, to invest time, to, to have intimacy, to be close, to be, uh, to be together in fellowship as God's called us to be one flesh, to be together in our lives. And then also in parenting, it's not always going to be the same. And so uh, I'm talking about this because we tend to have certain tendencies. And sometimes um, if we're not careful, as I have children that are now adult children and, and perhaps as the Lord would bless and they grow and in their lives in, in, in a few years, uh, they'll have children. I don't want to be a, a grandparent that is telling my, my daughter or my son that they need, oh, you need to do it this way. This is how you need to do it. This is, I mean, this is the only way to do it. And we need to be careful that we're not those kind of people with each other uh, within the congregation, but also without. You know, we all think we know the best way to do everything, don't we? The best way to do it is always what? My way, right? My way or the highway. Um, I can remember one of the chores in my house that I hated to do the most was the one that my father assigned me. I think he did it because he knew I hated it so much. Remember the Bible says, provoke not your children to wrath. I would often quote that verse to my father in this context. I'm like, you're provoking me. Like, like we have... I have a brother and I have a sister. Let's, like, rotate. No, this is your job. How long? Forever. Um, I don't know if this is you, but, like, I did not like to do the dishes. And I'm not talking about put the dishes in the dishwasher for some of you, right? I'm talk some, of, some of us, we hate doing that, loading, unloading, right? We, we hate now the chore of putting things into machines, taking things out of machines. But... You know, how many were growing up and you had to do things the hard way? You not only walked to school both ways, uh, uphill both ways in the snow every day, but you also had to wash dishes with your bare hands. Imagine that. Imagine that. The, the horror of child slave labor, of making your children wash dishes. Some of your kids, if you told them to do something like that, they'd look at you, they had no idea or concept. I mean, I was a young boy when I had to do it. But my dad had this, not only did he want me to do this job, but he wanted me to, to tell me exactly how to do the job. So, like, I'd be washing the dishes, and he'd say, that's not how you do it. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's getting done. I'm doing it. Well, you're running the water. You're wasting water. I'm like, where's the water going that I'm wasting? Like, you know, you're wasting it. You're wasting it. And I'm like... Have you ever, like, timed yourself in the shower? Like, I know, like, I'm wasting water by washing the dishes, but, you know, but you're watering your whatever outside, and that's not a waste. But we, we have, uh, you know, we're wasting water, or I wasn't, you know, doing the proper order of, like, rinse, scrub, post-rinse, dry. Like, it wasn't in the right order of all those things. Um, my dad's in heaven, so, you know, as, as in a sense of, uh, he's not going to come back. If he was alive, I'd probably be afraid to talk about this. So can't do anything now, you know. But, like, you know, the, the, the whole idea is, you know, we know what it's like sometimes to know the best way to do everything and how to micromanage. Now, I think I needed to learn a good way, a good process to do that. But I don't think my dad's goal ultimately is that today 
as a grown man, I would still be washing dishes in the same way that he taught me, or failure, or he disowned me, or, you know, and this is almost the way sometimes that some parents have, even in their beliefs with their standards and convictions, as soon as their children develop their own, it's like they've compromised. They, they got away from the Lord so much, you know, that now we can't, even, we can't even fellowship with them. It's so sad when that's how sometimes things become within the church and with families in the church that when we see differences that we automatically think that those differences mean an attack on the way we do things. That's what it means to be a controlling person, to want to control everything, not only in your life, but in the life of the way everyone else does things. And the unconscious aim of leaders is personal control rather than maturity. And this is why Paul says in verse number seven that an elder or leader should not be overbearing or quick-tempered. And then uh, I want to mention under-pastoring or being careless. It's what happens when a leader or leaders exercise too little leadership within the congregation. How many see uh, in our culture and in life that we tend to pendulum swing in parenting and in leadership? So what happens to a generation where maybe they grew up with overbearing leaders in their lives? They pendulum swing all the way to the other side. Anything that even is good leadership is abuse, abusive. So we've all been taught in our culture that there's a label for all of our conditions, right? Every, we're, we're all supposed to kind of diagnose what we are. We all have PTSD in some way over everything in our lives. I'm not here to complain about every nuance of the leadership of my parents and how they did things and think that they somehow handicapped me as a person because they tried to raise me for the Lord. We all look at leaders and say this, all leaders are imperfect, right? There is this idea that the ability, the, the ability to be critical about leaders and how they did things is some, somehow a spiritual gift. And, and that's what's happening today is this generation looks back on the former generation of the church. Um, while we were doing the Children's Center, I opened up one of these old closets um, upstairs, a little cabinet upstairs, and inside it had a bathroom cleaning schedule for the church or actually for the school when we had a Christian school. And my mom's name was up at the top of the list, and she had signed that she had cleaned the bathroom. And I was like, wow, that thing is ancient. It's like the Declaration of Independence I found. I thought it was like Nicolas Cage in that, you know, the movie. And I found, found, finally found it, you know. And I opened it up, and that, that old tarnished piece of paper with my mom's name on it that she had signed, that she had cleaned the upstairs bathroom. Really, what I know what happened is she was assigned to clean it. She had us clean it, and she signed her name to it. <laughs> but we were always around, you know, afterwards uh, while she was working, preparing uh, for her class the next day. And there were always jobs that we needed to do, odd jobs around the building. And so, you know, when people say that I've lived my life here, I really have. Like, since I was five years old, I, I know every nook and cranny of this place. I've been, uh, I've been everywhere, cleaned everywhere, done everything since I was a kid. And um, those are good memories that I have. Um, there, are, there are a lot of things that maybe when I was growing up that I didn't like or understand. And there are things that I do today as an adult that I do differently than the way that my predecessor had, had done here in leadership and that other people. But my job right now as a leader is not to look back and be a critic of everything that the people before me did, but also my job is not to always just repeat everything they did. I believe that we all should grow, be who we are, and follow the leadership of the Lord. Success is not being identical to someone else. Success is following Jesus and leading in the church in a sense of your calling uh, according to the word of God, but also according to how he leads in the culture of people that you're leading to the honor and glory of the Lord. It doesn't always look the same. Some things change. As you go upstairs today and look at the families or the children's center, you probably will say, I'm glad that things change because this looks so nice and not too long ago it didn't look so nice. So thank God for change. Um, let's not be the people who, you know, when the second temple was built, the Bible says the young men rejoiced and the old men wept because it wasn't as good as the former temple. You know, it wasn't as great as, I remember the good old days when things were a certain uh, kind of way. We tend to romanticize the past. 
we tend to think that things were better than what they were, and sometimes we get stuck in the past so that we don't have to do anything about the present. We only want things to be the, the way that they were, and I don't believe that that's good leadership either. And as Paul is talking to, leaders, to, the, to the, the subject of leadership, especially in interpretation within the church, but all leadership as it pertains to the church, or the church of God, the people of God, what happens when someone doesn't want to, if you would, take the reins as a leader or follow, lead, uh, follow good leadership uh, patterns and practices, they, av- they desire to avoid confrontation so they fail to correct false teaching or challenge ungodly living. What I don't want to become as a pastor is somebody who's afraid to say the hard things that the Bible says to us. Are you with me? I do want to exhort, I do want to encourage, but I don't want to fail to rebuke. Nobody likes rebuke, but how many have learned that being a good leader means you have to rebuke? As a parent, my least favorite thing as a parent was disciplining my kids. I never enjoyed it. I hated it. I never wanted to do it. I always wanted to avoid it. I would have rather just said, well, they didn't, you know, they didn't mean it that way. Didn't do it. No, if there was behavior that needed to be corrected, I had the responsibility to correct it. It wasn't a matter of desire it was a, or want. It was a matter of responsibility. God gave me these kids. My job is to point them to do what's right, to teach them to do what's right. And that always means that you have to rebuke. You have to be willing to if, you, if you're a good gardener, you love your plants, your flowers, your garden, and so you hate what? Does that mean you're a really judgmental, hateful person? That you're walking around pulling plants up by their roots and casting them to the side and burning them? What a terror. Do you see that? I saw watching a guy in his garden. He's ripping all this stuff up, and he's throwing it to the side, and he's burned it afterwards. Man, he just really doesn't like all of God's creation. No, if you're being a good steward, you learn to love what you're stewarding over and you learn to pull up what will choke what you're supposed to watch over. If you're a good shepherd, you love sheep and you hate wolves. You you hate that which is going to come in and destroy. And I don't mean hatred in a sense of that as a creation, as an animal, but you know that they don't coincide, they cannot be together. I cannot say, well, I really love wolves and I really love sheep and I just want to have a, a herd of sheep and wolves and we're going to grow them up together. And like side by side, they'll have perfect harmony. Eventually, one of those wolves will get hungry enough, right? We, we understand that as leaders, there is a two-sided coin to our leadership that is both positive and as what sometimes people view as negative. But you cannot be careless in your leadership and not rebuke. You can't avoid confrontation and be a good leader. Um, sometimes people are good at encouraging people, but they're weak at rebuking error. I, I've even heard some pastors on TV talk about that this is the ministry that God has given them, only to be encouraging, never to be rebuking, never to be negative. And I would say that is not the ministry that God has ever given any leader or pastor of a church. He says, preach the word, be instant in season and out of season, exhort and rebuke with long suffering, sound doctrine, holding fast to the faithful word of God, that you may be able to convince and also rebuke those that are seeking to attack and steal away from the truth. But in our, in, our, in our leadership, we can tend towards control or carelessness. So if the aim of those who over-pastor is personal control, I believe the aim of leaders who under-pastor or the aim of leaders who are careless is personal comfort. I worship comfort over conflict. So for the controlling person, I worship control over maturity, growing and helping people to do their job. For the person who is careless in their leadership, I worship comfort, and I don't want confrontation, and so I just avoid it altogether. We both know that, again, I'm mentioning that pendulum swing, 
that there is a medium there that is the right way to be a leader. In between those two, both also understanding that those two areas overlap in my leadership. While I recognize as I go down the road of life that there's a ditch on both sides of the road, I don't want to go from one ditch to the other. I want to stay on the road. So in pendulum swinging, let's be careful that we don't go from one extreme to the other. If you had overbearing leadership in your life, don't pendulum swing to the ditch on the other side of the road and careen into the ditch of carelessness and not parent your children because you had overbearing leaders in your life. If you are a person who perhaps had careless leaders in your life, don't pendulum swing to the extreme of being an overbearing person and be so extreme on the other side that you also careen into that, that ditch that gets you nowhere of just being an overbearing person. Let's stay on the road of the life of Jesus that we see who was both willing to exhort and encourage and show love and be merciful. He was full of grace and truth. That's what the Bible says. So if I'm full of Jesus, I will be full of what Jesus was full of. Make sense? Jesus was full of grace and truth. If I'm full of Jesus, I will be full of what he was full of. His spirit brings us uh, to that place in our lives where we're full of both grace and truth. I can be right, I can do right, but I also can be gracious in my demeanor. I don't have to fly off the handle. I don't have to lose control in my own life in order to gain control in helping someone else. But as we look at Titus 2, we're called to, to pastor one another in the church. We can all have a tendency to over-control or to under-control or to be careless in our leadership or to be overbearing in our leadership. And if you think you have a tendency towards being controlling or you think you have a tendency to, towards being careless, the key is, can I help you? The key is not to modify your style. That's not the key. The key is verse 9. Hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it's been taught to you. Verse 9. Holding fast the faithful word as you've been taught. Hold fast to the truth. That's why holding firmly, we're talking about a gospel life, to the gospel is so important. I grip hold of the gospel and the truth of the gospel in my life, and that brings me to balance in my life. So what, what is it that drives someone to be controlling? Well, Proverbs 4.23 tells us to keep our heart with all diligence, for out of it are all the issues of life. Literally, the rivers of our life, what comes out of us. For out of the, Jesus said, the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I, I often describe it to our church in this way, what's down in the well comes up in the bucket. So it didn't slip off my lips. It didn't slip into my mind. It was in my heart, and that's why it came to my mind and out of my mouth. So guard your heart. Guard the gateways to your heart. Not only are the gateways to your heart the five senses of your body, as they are the gateways to our soul. What we see, you're, you're, the monkeys, right? See no evil, speak no evil, hear no evil, do no evil. You know, we, we understand in our lives, while the five senses are gateways to our soul, often the five senses also tell us where our heart is. They are gauges that tell us like the dashboard lights on your car. How I many know it's not a good practice to see a check engine light and just put a sticker over it? Well, I don't see it, and so things must be okay. We all do that, right? The check engine light, oh, that's nothing. That's nothing. I don't even know why they made it, because all of us, we look at it, it'll go away. You know, when I turn it off, it's not on. When I turn the car off, it goes away. So it's only, it only is ever on when I'm driving. So it's okay. No, no, the, the lights are there to remind us that there may be something that needs to be checked out. And if we don't do something now, we may have catastrophic failure later. You may say, like, like the devil uh, kind of slipped into Eve's mind, you will not surely die. Yeah, oh, it's not, going to, it's not going to bring catastrophic failure for you now. 
But she was never considering how what she was going to do in disobeying God was going to affect her, her husband, or down the road, everybody, all of humanity. And this is why holding firmly to the gospel is so important. Our behavior goes wrong when our thinking about God and desires for God go wrong. Our behavior goes wrong when our thinking about God and our desires for God are misaligned. Have you ever um, had this attitude towards God? And I see people all the time. Well, I'm just living a good life, and so God is going to, I'm going to have God's blessing on my life because I'm doing these things. I'm doing these things because I want God's hand of blessing on me. Can I remind you that we are blessed of God with all spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus? I'm not blessed because I'm being good. I'm blessed because I'm in Jesus. I'm glad that God doesn't go, oh, what'd you do yesterday? <laughs> no blessing today. Oh, going to take my hand of blessing off of you. That, no, that's not our God. How many know a good parent doesn't look at their kid and go, oh, you messed up yesterday? No food today. Not, not going to bless you. Not going to meet your needs. Not going to supply for you, how many thankful that good parents don't do that? Good parents are faithful to be a blessing, to fulfill the responsibility, regardless of the performance of their children. They continue to love them and nurture them and lead them. It doesn't mean they enable their bad behaviors. It doesn't mean they don't discipline them, but they don't withhold blessing. God is never withholding blessing from the lives of his children. We are blessed with all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. I'm not saying that we cannot better we cannot better enjoy the blessings of God as obedient children because to be an obedient child of God, to be a follower of Jesus Christ, gives me access to enjoy the blessings, all the blessings that I have in Jesus, to enjoy them, but God doesn't remove them. How many thankful that eternal life is in Jesus? And regardless of your performance, God is not removing the life that he's given you and all the blessings that are attached to it. And I've had my views of God in many ways misaligned when I viewed God that way. Well, God's going to bless me if I do this, and he's not going to bless me if I do that. I'm thankful that that old covenant way that God dealt with humanity is gone under the new covenant, fulfilled in Jesus Christ, not on the basis of our works or, or what we've done, but now in Jesus. I am blessed because I'm in Jesus. I'm not blessed because I won the lottery. I'm not blessed because I got healed. I'm not blessed because I got what I want. I'm blessed because I'm in Jesus. Prosperity gospel blessing is also a bad way to look at Jesus. In other words, I'm always giving to get. I'm only giving, well, the offering plate's going by today. If I don't put my 10% in, then God's not going to bless my... No, God's going to continue. God's going to continue to bless us and provide and meet our needs. But I'm going to tell you, you're not going to enjoy the Christian life if you're holding a tight fist on your possessions and never releasing to give to God and to God's work and to uh, fulfilling the purposes of God's kingdom on earth right now until he returns, you are never going to fully enjoy what you have until you give to God everything. When we put all that we have in God's hands, all that we have just multiplies and becomes better. And I don't even mean that in the sense of your bank account is just going to multi multiply and become better. If you're thinking that God is a lottery ticket, then you are looking at God all wrong. God did not come to give us what we want. He came to give us his heart, his mind, his will. Prayer is not getting God to do what I want. Prayer is getting my heart aligned with God and his will and asking him to help me desire what his will is in my life and in this world. And this is why holding firmly to the gospel is so important. People who are overbearing or controlling because they want, they want to feel like they're in control. How many have learned that that's an illusion? You're not in control of your life. You're not in control of your next breath. You don't know what's going to happen next. And they're trying to prove themselves to other people through their actions, through their performances, almost because they were taught, even through a bad theology, that you prove yourself by your actions, by your performances. And so not only do they judge themselves through that lens, but they judge everybody else by what they're, how they're dressing, how they're acting, how they're talking, what they're doing. And they're always, you, you can never... Make that person happy. They're always undersatisfied with your performance. And here's the reason why. They have not embraced the truth 
that God is great and that he's in control. You know who is in control? God. Again, the key if you're a controlling person is not to modify your style. The key is to embrace the truth. Hold to the truth, the gospel that says this. I'm not in control. God's in control. And I can trust God to control what I can't control. So I can do what God's told me to do. Well, what about this? Well, what about if this happens? Well, what if I don't know if I get there, if this is going to happen or that's going to happen or, or if this is not ready or that's not. What about and I have, I don't, I, my mind is just trying to control, 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 control. No, God is in control. And I'm going to do what I can. I'm going to do all that I've been given responsibility to do. And all the things that cause worry and fear and anxiety that I can't control, I'm going to let God, who is in control, take care of those things because he will do a far better job than my worries and frets and fears and anxieties. How many have learned that your anxiety and your fear has not added one ounce of goodness to your life? It's a detractor. It's, it takes away from your life. It robs you of relationships. It, it hinders your relationship with your spouse, with your children. It hinders your relationship with the church. It does not help. It is not something to hold on to. It's something to let go, confess, repent of, and turn away from it. And, and, and by the way, sometimes it's something that you're habitually stuck in and you need help with. You need to talk to somebody. You need therapy. You need somebody to help you with that situation. You can't pray everything away. Some things you need to do things about. How many have learned that? Some people say, well, I got this condition. I'm just going to ask God. Well, ask God, but also do what you're supposed to do. Fulfill your responsibility. God didn't give you hands so that you could only ask him to do everything. He gave you hands so that you could get busy doing what he told you to do. And he's not going to do everything for you because he's a good father. He's going to let you do things. He's going to let you fail and learn. He's going to want you to take a step of faith and fall flat on your face. And again, I would rather move and fail than never move. I would rather learn through my failures than never do anything. They may believe truths in theory, but they do not hold them firmly in their hearts, and this is revealed in moments of pressure. And then lastly today, what is, that, what is it that drives someone who's, who's careless? We're talking about control and carelessness. Let me finish with carelessness. What is it that drives someone who's careless? Well, people who are careless are careless because they fear the rejection of other people or they crave their approval or want to be liked. It's what the Bible describes as the fear of man that brings a snare because fear has torment. They may be careless because they want a comfortable life, so they avoid the hard things that are involved in leadership. They pride themselves, perhaps, in only being encouraging, pride themselves in only being positive thinkers, and they never handle weeds in their life. They never ha handle the things that they're supposed to in their, in their life. So what is the cure to this? Again, it's not, it's not changing your methods. The cure to this is they have not embraced the truth that God is the glorious one who should be feared. When I fear God, I have no need to what? fear anything else. But if I'm afraid of everything else, it's because I'm not really fearing God. I'm afraid that God is not going to protect me. I'm not really fearing God. I'm not really acknowledging God's control in my life either. And so I'm afraid of everything else. Some people say, well, you know, everybody's afraid of something. And so these are just my fears and I just have to learn to live with them. How about we learn to overcome our fears? Church, how about we learn to overcome our fears? instead of excusing them. Well, this is just what I'm afraid of. No, this is what I'm afraid of, but God can help me overcome this. I don't always have to be a person that's locked up in my heart and mind because I'm afraid. Everything that God calls us to do brings some fear to us when we have no experience. How many know some of the things that you have confidence at the first time you did them, you were afraid of. You just learned through experience that you could have confidence in areas where you had no experience before because experience brings confidence. But what fear does is keeps you from ever having experience. And so it keeps you stunted in your growth. 
It makes for bad parents. It makes for bad spouses. It makes for bad, bad people in the church. We're never growing. We stay in maturity, immaturity because we're afraid of everything. What are you afraid of? Is it God in a sense of do you fear God that you know that he has control of everything that you're afraid of? When the, when the disciples saw Jesus walking on water, what do you think that message sent to them? They were afraid first of the storm. But the Bible says when Jesus stepped into the boat that they were more afraid of him than they were afraid of the storm. They actually forgot about the storm because Jesus was there and they were in awe of him. Can I tell you this? When you realize that Jesus is walking on top of the things that you are afraid of and you're in the boat with him in life, you really don't need to be afraid of all that stuff anymore. You can learn like Peter to say, God, call me out on the water. Let me do what you're doing. We could be real critical of Peter, but how many of us would have asked Jesus to let us walk with him on what we were afraid of? Peter had the courage to say, I'm scared of this storm, but Jesus is walking on the water, and so if he is, I can too because he's with me. Jesus didn't just come to perform for us. He came to perform through us. He wants to live in you, and he wants the same things that he did to be done through you. Remember, that's what he said to the disciples. The same things that I've done, and greater things shall you do, because I go unto my Father. Now, I'm not talking about that you should try to go walk out on the lake today you'll probably get some muddy feet. But what I would say to you, I'm sorry for even calling that a lake. I know that's not a... What looking at Jesus should do to us is cause us to overcome our fears and to be lost in awe and marveling in his ability to walk on them, to be above all of them. I don't know what you're afraid of that's keeping you from being who you're supposed to be in the leadership that God has called you to. But I'll tell you, if you spend enough time with Jesus and looking at Jesus, you will overcome those fears. You'll stop being afraid of stuff and you'll start being in awe of your Savior and it'll help you to say, Jesus, help me to walk on what I'm afraid of. Without you, I'd sink. Without you, I wouldn't be able to do this, but with you, all things are possible. I can overcome in this situation. Leaders need to disciple themselves with the gospel before they can disciple others. It doesn't mean that they need to be perfect. Per progress is what the mark is, not perfection. Progress is required. Perfection is not. I hope that you'll take that away. With all of us as believers, what's required in us is progress, not perfection. So here's the, here's the ask today. Are you progressing as a believer? Are you growing? Or has it been some time since there's been any marked growth or transformation in your life? I'm not talking about outward performance. I'm talking about what you know in your own heart. There's a lot of great books out there, um, self-help books that talk about change, you know, the small changes we make in our lives, and, and they're all great in a sense of in their ideas. But let me tell you, what I'm talking about is not self-help. I'm talking about the powerful presence of the Spirit of God in your life to help you to overcome the things that are in your heart that he knows are there that are just keeping you from being like him. When I look at Jesus, I don't see fear. I see someone who's able to command all things into his obedience. Leaders need to apply the gospel to their own hearts, otherwise they will be like hypocrites of whom Jesus warns who try to take specks out of people's eyes when they have planks in their own eyes. God wants us neither to be overbearing control freaks or people who are comfort zone seeking careless people in leadership. He wants us to be Christ-like in our leadership. Father, we thank you today for the opportunity 
to gather here in this place. I pray that as we've considered the Holy Spirit's words through Paul to Titus, to all of us, not just the church that was at Crete, and to Titus who was there, setting those things in order and calling the church there to these instructions that are Holy Spirit given and now the canon of Scripture for us to obey and submit to. As we've been given this call to leadership in all of our lives, I pray for husbands and wives and parents, moms and dads and grandparents and friends and and bosses and managers and God, all of us today, we have some area of leadership. And I pray that within the church, as we're organized and we have leaders, that we would all desire, not perfection as we cannot ever become perfect until you return, but progress. And today, may we say, God, we know your will is progress, so God, what does that look like for me? Maybe that's the question. Can I just ask you to do that in your own heart before the Lord? God, if your requirement in my own leadership responsibility is progress, what steps do you have for me today in my faith? Where have I not been faithful? Where am I tending towards control or carelessness in my leadership? Where am I finding just places to hide instead of comparing myself only to Christ and looking to Jesus and being in awe of him and saying, God, help me to be more like Jesus. Something I can be definitive about today with you, church, is that it is God's will for you to be like Jesus. You say, well, what does that look like personally? I don't know your heart. He does. And so here's your job. The one who knows your heart is the one you need to cry out today to. Jesus, you know my heart. Holy Spirit of God within me. Lead me to be more like Jesus. What area of your life has popped out, perhaps through the message? If God is saying, this is the area that's not like Jesus, that I want to bring change, can you believe God for that? Can you say, God, do in me what you desire to do, but also give me courage to do what I know I need to do with what I've heard today, that I would not just be a hearer of the word, but I would be a doer. I would act on what you've said. Lead me, guide me to take the right steps. Help me to overcome my fears, my doubts, my anxieties. Help me to overcome my desire to control things rather than to have faith in your ability to control everything. God, help me to embrace that in this life, you are our leader. You are our Lord, and we look to you. God, I pray today that you would do your will in your church today. This is your church. These are your people. These are the sheep of your pasture. Thank you for allowing me to preach your word. I pray it was done faithfully today. I pray that you'd forgive me, God, for my my own error, my own flesh. But you'd help us, Lord, all to have a desire to do your will and to obey your word. And God, as we come together today to uh, just remember these things, God, may they bring healthy change in our marriages, in our homes, as parents to our children, but ultimately, may we all know this starting point first, that we are in a relationship with you through Jesus. I I don't want to move on today without causing you to ask this question, do I have a relationship with God? Am I sure that if I was to die right now, I would be with Jesus forever? I, I would be in his presence. I would be with him. If you're not sure if you'd die today, that you would be with the Lord You would be with Jesus. You're forever in a relationship with him. And can I just remind you of the gospel? Jesus Christ, the only begotten son of God, was born on this earth for the purpose of coming to pay for our sins as the lamb, the sacrifice, the one who would die to take our place. None of us could pay through our performance or our good works to become forgiven, God, for our condition. The wages of our sin is death, but... The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And if you're not a child of God today, there's never been a time where you've had transformation because you've believed the good news of the gospel, that Jesus died for you, that he rose again, that he ever lives, on, and he sits on the throne. He's alive because he rose from the grave, victorious, 
as the God-man who died for our sins and you put your faith in him. Why don't you ask Jesus today, if you're not sure you're in a relationship with him, say, Jesus, please forgive me for what I've done. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. God, would you forgive me, make me your child, give me a new heart. God, I'm trusting you. The best way you can say that to God is he's leading you. I believe if God's already put these things in your heart, then he's already doing that work. Would you just respond to God's spirit and trust him? Put your faith in him. Boy, you're going to begin a walk with him that'll change you for the rest of your life. And I hope that you'll put faith in him today. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand to your feet? The guys are going to come. We're going to have an offering and then we're going to sing this chorus and then we're going to go right upstairs into the, fan, into the children's center. And I hope you say, I don't have kids. I hope that you'll just come see what's been done. We're going to have a, a short prayer up there of dedication and then we'll let everybody go. And um, uh, I hope that you'll be a part of that if you can. Let's sing, I love you, Lord, together. Father, today we are so thankful for the message that was preached, but we're thankful for your church family, the body of Christ that you have brought together, and Lord, we're just so thankful for all your goodness to us. And Father, as we dismiss and as we even go upstairs in just a moment to dedicate of just your faithfulness, your goodness to us, and uh, Lord, as we dedicate, Lord, the new Children's Center, Lord, I pray that that room would be used for your honor and for your glory. Father, we love you, we thank you, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Everyone can make their way upstairs if you're able to. If not, God bless. Have a wonderful day.
God has used this ministry in any way to be a blessing to you, please take a moment to send us an email to info at opendoornj.org. Also, if you would like to support this ministry financially, you can do so online at opendoornj.org. Thanks for tuning in.